Often overlooked in history, the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan was a pivotal moment of the 20th century. Not only did the nine years of intense fighting result in hundreds of thousands of casualties and millions of refugees, but the war also shook up global politics as relations seemed to be improving between the USSR and Western powers, leading to a renewed intensity of Cold War tensions that would last for years. The invasion started off smoothly, but quickly transformed into a nightmare of guerrilla warfare and a struggle for power over an angry population. Today, we'll jump into the Soviet motivation to attack Afghanistan in the first place, the battle plans for the full-scale invasion, and why the Soviets, despite winning individual battles, were unable to win the war. So let's start with the basics. Afghanistan is a dry, landlocked, mountainous country located in Central Asia. Its unique location makes it a sort of historical crossroads between neighboring powers from every direction. It has been the location of wars for thousands of years, even being conquered by Alexander the Great well over 2,000 years ago. In the 19th century, Afghanistan became the focus of the British and Russian empires, who used it as a bit of a buffer zone between themselves as they gobbled up land in their respective halves of Asia, with the Russian Empire taking land in the north and the British empire focusing mostly on the south. Britain feared that Russia would use Afghanistan to invade India, and Russia feared that Britain would invade Afghanistan to establish dominance in Central Asia. This period of tension and distrust was later known as the Great Game, and it became a bit of a foreshadowing of the Cold War. But the distrust wasn't unfounded. The British Empire did enter Afghanistan on three separate occasions, known as the Three Anglo-Afghan Wars. And let's be honest, if you look into most nations' history, chances are that the British Empire got involved at more than one point. In this case, Britain's two goals of the conflicts were to put an end to Afghan raiding parties that were crossing into British-occupied India, and also to limit the growing Russian influence in the country. The third and final Anglo-Afghan war in 1919 ended with a compromise, creating a new border with northwestern India, an area which is today actually Pakistan, and the recognition of a fully independent Afghanistan, which a short time later was officially renamed the Kingdom of Afghanistan. In 1930, Mohammad Zahir Shah was crowned King of Afghanistan after the assassination of his father. The 40-year reign of Zahir Shah was generally marked by a widespread peace, stability, and modernization. Under his rule, the Kingdom of Afghanistan was accepted into the League of Nations and sought good relations with both sides of the Cold War, hoping to avoid making enemies as the nation developed, which worked quite well as both the USSR and the United States funded the growing Afghanistan with millions of dollars in economic aid. But in those days, the enemies that posed a threat to Zahir Shah weren't overseas. They were actually right under his nose. In 1973, the king flew to Italy for an eye treatment, and while he was gone, a coup d'etat led by his cousin Daoud Khan overthrew the monarchy and established the Republic of Afghanistan. Rather than then return and wage war for the throne, Zahir Shah formally abdicated from the crown and remained in Italy, ending his reign as the last monarch of Afghanistan. Daoud Khan and much of the public had been upset with the king for several reasons. A famine in the early 70s was poorly handled, and the king had failed to implement several laws that the recently formed parliament had passed, meaning that with widespread support from the people, the coup was carried out efficiently and with little resistance. In the new Republic of Afghanistan, Daoud Khan promised economic prosperity and social reforms. He set a seven-year plan for economic growth, began military training with India, and reaffirmed the country's no-side policy of staying neutral between the nuclear powers of the Cold War. To get all this done, Daoud filled political positions with allies from the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, the PDPA, a communist party that was gaining traction in the country. By 1978, Daoud had been in power for five years, but the country's economy hadn't grown and standards of living weren't improving. And despite his no-side policy, Daoud had been leaning heavily toward Western powers, slowly losing relations with the Soviet Union over their foreign policies. He also had strong views of Pashtun nationalism, the idea that parts of Pakistan belong to Afghanistan and should be taken back with military force. The communist PDPA began to see Daoud less as a progressive leader and more as a threat to the nation's security and independence. This culminated in another coup in 1978, the Saar Revolution. The previous coup was nearly bloodless, but the Saar Revolution was the beginning of a long period of violence, and being a revolution of the socialist nature, it was, of course, backed by the Soviet Union. Union. A trusted tank commander told Daoud that military intelligence was warning of an imminent attack on the capital, Kabul. In response, Daoud had several tanks and plenty of soldiers stationed around his palace, but little did he know the tank commander 
had already joined in the uprising. It had all been a lie. There was no imminent attack, and instead the tanks turned their guns on the president himself. An estimated 2,000 people were killed in the fighting in the capital, including Daoud and most of his family. The country went through another name change, now called the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan, and two new leaders emerged, Prime Minister Hafizullah Amin and the President Nur Mohammad Taraki. Immediately after taking office, Amin and Taraki pushed for national changes. They increased taxes, changed economic and land policies, and advocated for education and marriage reforms and women's rights, declaring that they wanted to uproot feudalism and move on from what they saw as old and primitive laws. Anyone who spoke out against the new government was ruthlessly shut down with imprisonment or execution, and indeed thousands were put to death. None of this sat well at all with the public, especially the more conservative folks living in rural areas who were now being taxed for their land and being told that their way of life would have to change. In 1979, riots started breaking out in response to the new regime, and thousands of people took to the streets in violent protests. At the same time, several local leaders began uniting under warlords who took control of vast portions of the countryside. These fighters from various ethnic backgrounds joined forces and were collectively known as the Mujahideen. And keep them in mind, because they're going to become a key player in this story. With little ability to counter the rebel forces forming in his country, President Taraki turned to the Soviet Union for help suppressing the riots and fighting rebel militant groups that were forming. The USSR supplied weapons and vehicles to the Afghan army, but were reluctant to enter into direct conflict at this point. Taraki also appealed to the Soviet Union for help with taking down his fellow leader, Amin, who he saw as too radical and authoritarian. When Amin realized what was happening, he had Taraki assassinated and declared himself both president and Prime Minister, and now in full control of Afghanistan. The government cracked down even harder on the opposition, but as this often does, it only had the opposite effect, strengthening the motivation to resist. At one point, an entire division of the Afghan army was sent to fight the Mujahideen, but ended up joining them instead. This is where the USSR really started to get involved. Soviet Secretary General Leonid Brezhnev feared that the changes in Afghanistan could lead to an Islamic State government which had just happened next door in Iran, and that such a radical change in the country could spread the feeling of independence to other predominantly Muslim countries in Central Asia that were under Soviet rule, which provided heaps of land and natural resources to the USSR. Losing these republics would not be acceptable, not to mention the fact that relations had already become strained as Afghanistan's strengthened its ties with the West. Now, as everyone knows, the Soviet Union wasn't just one to sit around and watch, so Brezhnev immediately began preparations for the Soviet military to intervene in Afghanistan and defeat the Mujahideen insurgency. And what will be first on the invasion checklist? Eliminate and replace the radical Afghan president, Amin. To get a handle on the growing civil unrest in Afghanistan, the Soviet Union decided that President Amin was more of a danger than an ally, and he needed to be rather quickly removed from power. After a quick assessment of their playbooks, the KGB unsurprisingly decided the easiest way to go about this was to assassinate him. Amin, however, survived their first poisoning attempt. He then upped his security, which meant that a KGB sniper couldn't get a clear shot of him. Sure, this was two failures in a row, but one thing the Soviets had going for them was that Amin had complete trust in the Soviet Union and didn't believe they could possibly be behind the poisoning. After all, he was still receiving military aid and believed the superpower to be on his side. Taking full advantage of Amin's unwavering trust, the Soviet Union told him that he would be much safer from the rebels if he relocated away from the center of Kabul to the Taj Peg Palace in the countryside. In reality, this relocation meant it would just be much easier for the Soviets to come and kill him. In December 1979, Soviet ground forces officially entered Afghanistan with the initial goal of liberating the capital from the Mujahideen, taking key strategic points in the surrounding area, and disarming the Afghan military. The invasion force consisted of around 80,000 troops, 1,800 tanks, and 2,000 armored vehicles. These forces constructed pontoons to cross the Amu Daya and made quick work of their objectives. They seized airfields and communication hubs and met little resistance. The Afghan army had no coordinated response at all, as the Soviets had sabotaged the Afghan army for weeks in advance, having them remove ammunition from their guns and fuel from their tanks for yearly maintenance. Hearing that the capital and surrounding areas were being taken by the Soviets, Amin was relieved. It was still under the impression that the Soviet army had arrived as per his request and was there to save him and his country. His excitement didn't last long, though, as he was poisoned for a second time, and this time the poison was much stronger. Amin somehow survived, though, partially because he drank Coca-Cola with his dinner that night and the 
carbonation diluted the toxins. Regardless, though, he ended up in a coma in his palace and had doctors at his side constantly monitoring his vitals. With poison not finishing him off, the only remaining option was to go ahead with Operation Storm 333. Essentially, forget discreetly assassinating him, it's time to go to the palace with guns blazing and pop him off. Around 650 Soviet troops gathered around the Tajpeg Palace looking for any weaknesses, but the palace was heavily guarded. Anti-aircraft vehicles defended from any airborne assault. Three tanks overlooked the property from a nearby hill. Outposts surrounded the entire estate, and in total there were around 2,500 Afghan soldiers standing guard. But the soldiers ready to storm the defenses weren't just any regular Ivan with a rifle. These were Soviet special forces, also known as Spetsnaz, which consisted of paratroopers, the so-called Muslim Battalion, and an elite Zenith squad. If anyone could get the job done, it was these guys. For three days, the Spetsnaz made strange movements around the perimeter of the palace grounds, and the Afghan defenders started lowering their guard a bit, and to further confuse the situation, many of the Spetsnaz were also given Afghan military uniforms. The assault began on December 27, 1979, when a small group of Soviet troops ambushed the tank position on the hill near the palace. The Afghan soldiers were so caught off guard by the attack that they weren't even inside their tanks, and they were killed before they could get back to them. The Soviets then took control of the three free tanks and began firing them at the palace, which turned out to be a bit of a mistake. With the palace being so heavily guarded, the Spetsnaz needed to utilize the element of surprise as much as possible. But when the tanks started firing, surprise was out of stock, and the forces immediately mobilized for the all-out attack on the palace. The anti-air vehicles were the next positions to be taken. Their guns then lowered from the sky and fired directly onto the palace itself. The paratrooper division began capturing the perimeter outposts, and the rest of the troops hopped inside armored personnel carriers and started the dangerous drive up the heavily guarded road taking fire from all sides. This would prove to be the most difficult part of the operation, as the palace was situated on a slight hill, and the only road leading through the minefields wound around the base of the slopes, meaning the Afghan army had the high ground. In fact, the angles were so steep that the machine guns on the Soviet vehicles couldn't aim high enough to see most of the defenders, who were now raining down machine gun fire and explosives on the armored personnel carriers. Several APCs were disabled or immobilized, forcing dozens of soldiers to jump out and move from cover to cover on foot. To make matters worse, the paratrooper squad had missed one of the machine gun outposts, which was now firing on the Soviets from behind. Suddenly, in the middle of the intense fighting, massive explosions were heard off in the distance from Kabul. These were communication and electricity hubs being detonated by Soviet engineers, cutting off all forms of contact with the palace. Apparently, these were supposed to announce the beginning of the attack, but the saboteurs had messed up the timers. The Spetsnaz continued winding their way up the deadly road, and after losing several APCs, they finally reached the palace and secured cover outside of its doors. When the rest of the assault force caught up, one group of Spetsnaz entered the front door and one broke in through a window, creating two fronts of attack for the remaining defenders in the building. The Muslim battalion was left outside to protect against any arriving reinforcements. Once inside the building, the elite soldiers moved from room to room, engaging in intense firefights in every direction. By this point, Amin was out of his coma and he stumbled over to his bodyguards. When his men informed him that they were under attack, he told them not to worry as the Soviets would come to their rescue. No matter what his officers told him, he refused to believe that the Soviet Union was the one attacking the building. Amin died shortly after waking up. The exact details of his death have never been confirmed by any eyewitnesses. One story says that he was taken into custody by the soldiers and died of convulsions from lingering complications with the poison, and another story says that he was blown up by a grenade. Regardless of what really happened, the end result was the same. President Amin was dead. After the palace fell into Soviet control and caught fire, and after everyone realized they were fighting the Soviets and not Mujahideen rebels, hundreds of Afghan soldiers surrendered. The fighting was over, and the palace assault had been successful. Overall, despite being outnumbered nearly four to one, the Soviets suffered just 20 deaths, though the majority were injured in one way or another, and the Afghan army lost over 350. In addition to the death toll, nearly 1,700 Afghan troops were taken prisoner after the fighting was over. The entire battle, as chaotic as it was, lasted just 40 minutes. Afghanistan was now without a leader, and the Soviets happened to have the perfect guy to take over that spot. Once the dust had settled, a man named Baba Kamal was flown to Afghanistan, immediately assuming the role of leader of the country. This was the beginning of a Soviet puppet government. Radio stations announced his new presidency, and that the previous president had been tried and executed for his crimes against his people. The Soviet Union now had the Afghan government in its hands, and the invasion was off to a good start. All that was left to do was crush the rebellion and teach the Afghan army how to keep the peace. Unfortunately for the USSR, this is a lot easier said than done, and the war was about to get a whole lot bloodier.
During the first few days of the invasion, the Soviets quickly took control of large cities and the main roads, but 80% of the country was still under the control of the Mujahideen, a problem that was growing by the day. Trying to avoid as much direct conflict as possible, the Soviet Union's first idea was to have the newly reformed Afghan army fight the majority of the battles, while the Soviet troops supported and trained them, but this was incredibly ineffective. Most soldiers in the new Afghan army had no real motivation to fight. They were simply there for a stable paycheck in an otherwise unstable country. Desertion rates were high, morale was next to non-existent, and a mutiny even broke out shortly after the new president was put into power. On the other hand, the Mujahideen were fighting furiously. They had the home court advantage, knew how to use the terrain to their advantage, and had unity among their fighters. And let's not forget, of course, that the Mujahideen had a little bit of outside help. During the Cold War, if the USSR was getting involved in any country, you could bet an arm and a leg that the United States was playing for the other team. In the case of the Mujahideen, the United States was supplying them with weapons and money. And it wasn't just the US. The UK, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and even China were supporting the rebel forces. It was also seen by many as a war of mainly Muslim fighters standing up against a foreign invader, meaning it was now a jihad, or a struggle of religious and noble aims. This attracted foreign volunteers who were eager to join the fight, including an interest in a fellow that you might have heard of named Osama bin Laden. The Mujahideen, who were also receiving training in Pakistan, were only growing stronger and more equipped with every passing day, and the Afghan army simply couldn't compete. The Soviets were left no choice but to take the lead and go all out on the rebel forces. Uh, let's just say they didn't hold back. There were skirmishes and battles almost daily across the country as Soviet soldiers were fired on in the streets and ambushed in the countryside as they fought for control of the land. But some of the biggest battles with the rebels took place between the years of 1980 and 1985 in the Panjshir Valley, a region in the Hindu Kush mountains of northern Afghanistan. This was a crucial location as guerrilla fighters in the mountains, led by Ahmad Shah Massoud, the Lion of Panjshir, used the terrain to attack Soviet supply convoys and quickly disappear back into the mountains. It was becoming so dangerous that truck drivers were even given medals for successfully crossing it and delivering their supplies. This chokehold on Soviet logistics made it the highest priority. The first offensive into the Panjshir Valley was a bit of a mess for the Soviets, who brought three of their own battalions and an Afghan battalion to the fight. The Mujahideen forces were estimated to only be between 200 and 1,000, meaning that they didn't stand much of a chance in open combat, but their guerrilla tactics proved to be a stubborn thorn in the USSR's side for years. They fired from concealed positions on the steep mountainsides and fled if the approaching Soviets got too close. In the villages, the Soviets couldn't tell which houses were the ones shooting at them, so they destroyed them all indiscriminately, and the Mujahideen would simply retreat into the mountains. To keep the area under their control, they left behind an Afghan army outpost for future offensives and returned to their base. As you can imagine, the Afghan outpost didn't last very long, and the next battles were fought as the Soviets tried to retake it from the rebels, but eventually the Soviets gave up and retreated completely from the valley. After regrouping and doing extensive reconnaissance on their enemies, the Soviets' next plan for attacking the Mujahideen was as follows. First, an intense aerial bombardment. Next, transport helicopters would drop troops into the area from unexpected sides to engage with the rebels, after which armored vehicles would arrive to finish the job. Sounds great on paper, but the Soviet Union had been building its army for decades, anticipating a more conventional war with uh, similar European opponents, and they didn't adjust their tactics much for Afghanistan. After intentionally leaking bad info to the Mujahideen, the Soviets employed their full show of force in the Panjshir Valley and took control of the entire region. But once again, though they technically accomplished their goal, they had done little in terms of killing insurgents who had mainly just retreated, and the Soviets simply left the area after the battle. These types of battles did more to hurt the Soviet cause than to help it. One of the objectives in the heavier assaults was to destroy the village farms, hoping that it would starve out the insurgents. Instead, all this accomplished was killing innocent bystanders, which only angered more of the civilian population to join the Mujahideen. Eventually, a ceasefire was signed between the Soviets and the Panjshir warlord Massoud. Massoud was mocked for this decision, which was seen as giving in to the foreign invaders, but he saw it as an opportunity to focus on strengthening his forces and coming back stronger. After 1985, there were almost no large-scale operations taking place in the Panjshir Valley. But by now, the fighting wasn't only in Afghanistan. The war was becoming increasingly unpopular back home in the Soviet Union, who was continually lying about grand success, when in reality, they were stuck in the mud.
The war took a turn when in 1985 Mikhail Gorbachev became the leader of the Soviet Union. Gorbachev was progressive and wanted to get his country out of the economic stagnation that it had been stuck in for years. He saw the war in Afghanistan as a bleeding wound for the Soviet Union and wanted to leave it. A renewed massive effort was put into stabilizing and training the Afghan army, with them now taking the front lines in any combat, while the Soviets mainly would provide air and artillery support. Gorbachev also removed the Afghan puppet President Kamal, who he believed had failed in his duties to pacify the nation and elected Mohammad Najbullah, ex-chief of the Afghan secret police. Najbullah did a much better job of uniting his country, even expressing a willingness to negotiate with the Mujahideen, and in 1986 a ceasefire was agreed to by many local parties. But despite the ceasefire, much of the fighting across the country continued. In 1987, Operation Magistral was approved one of the last major battles of the war. The operation began in November with the goal of capturing the road between Gardez and Kost, which was under Mujahideen occupation. The road was heavily defended and for the assault, 20,000 Soviet troops and 8,000 Afghan troops were deployed. To start off the battle, mannequin paratroopers were dropped over various positions along the road, drawing fire from the Mujahideen and betraying their positions. This allowed artillery to strike with high accuracy along the sides of the road, along with airstrikes. After the initial barrage, the tanks began moving down the road, covered on the sides by Afghan and Soviet units, all of which were under constant fire from machine guns, RPGs, and mortars. To handle all the bullets and grenades coming from the sides of the hills, paratroopers were dropped from high altitude to take control of the tops of the slopes. One of these hills, later dubbed Hill 3234, named after its height in meters, became the scene of a legendary battle. 39 Soviet paratroopers from the 345th Independent Guards Airborne Regiments landed on top of the hill and immediately came under fire from two sides. Their enemies on the hill, which consisted of both Mujahideen and trained Pakistani mercenaries, numbered in the hundreds and had them completely surrounded. The Soviets were under fire from two sides, being blasted with rocket launchers and grenades. Some of the Mujahideen were killed by supporting artillery strikes, but these were becoming too risky as the rebels got close to the Soviets. When the explosion stopped, the shootout began, and despite the odds, the paratroopers managed to hold their position, and just when it seemed like they were about to run out of bullets, reinforcements arrived by helicopter to save the day. Only six Soviets were killed in the fighting, two of which were posthumously awarded the Hero of the Soviet Union, while the Mujahideen lost as many as 250 men. Back on the road, the battle raged on. Soviet armor punched through the rebel fortifications and helicopters were highly effective at taking out enemies behind cover. After several weeks of fighting, the operation was a success, and the road and the city of Kost were officially liberated. But as always, the moment the Soviets packed their bags and left, the area was flooded with Mujahideen, just as it was before. The Soviets could win every battle they wanted, but were unable to do anything with their victory to make any real progress in the war. For them, fighting a counterinsurgency movement was like trying to eat soup with a fork, and they'd had enough. Beginning in 1987, Gorbachev announced that the Soviet Union would begin withdrawing its troops from Afghanistan. This sped up after the country signed the Geneva Accords, an agreement to permanently withdraw, and by February 1989, the withdrawal was complete. Through the nine years of war, the Soviets lost over 14,000 men and the Afghan army lost about 20,000, while the Mujahideen lost an estimated 100,000. But as with any war, the people who suffered the most were the innocent citizens of Afghanistan. Over a million civilians were killed and hundreds of thousands were wounded. Over five million fled Afghanistan. Afghanistan, becoming refugees mostly in Pakistan and Iran, and two million were internally displaced, making it one of the largest refugee crises in history. The Soviets were accused of numerous war crimes, including chemical weapon attacks, torture, and rape. Indiscriminate bombing runs destroyed civilian farmland and irrigation canals, leading to widespread famine, and numerous towns were completely wiped from the face of the earth. Afghanistan's culture was targeted as well, as Soviet soldiers looted homes and museums, taking home 30 military trucks stuffed full of artifacts. By the end of the war, even once the last Soviet troops had crossed the border back to their home, the hostilities didn't end. The Afghan army was left with the burden of handling the Mujahideen, and they struggled to fight them without direct Soviet assistance. Several cities fell back under rebel control, and fighting erupted across the country once again. The war with the Soviet Union marked the beginning of a violent conflict that has endured in Afghanistan for decades, including a civil war and the rapid spread of extremism. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan affected the entire world. It is cited by many as the catalyst for the collapse of the Soviet Union, and many members of the Mujahideen went on to found terrorist cells like Al-Qaeda, leading to terrorist attacks in several countries, and eventually bringing the United States into a lengthy conflict with the groups that they once funded. Afghanistan has seen constant death and destruction for over 40 years, and with the Taliban now in control, it's unlikely that's going to change anytime soon. Perhaps in the coming years, yet another superpower will try their luck 
in the graveyard of empires. So I really hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, why not check out another one of our videos you might enjoy? It's the Mexican-American War, which I'm going to link to on the screen now. Check that out. And as always, thank you for watching.